Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture, a magazine of American beekeeping. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flotta, the editor of Bee Culture magazine. Good to see you again, Jeff. Yeah, Kim, it's good to see you too. Boy, you had an exciting weekend on the uh, pollinator day. <laughs> Uh, we all got wet, but <laughs> it actually it turned out okay. You had a couple house guests? Yeah, we did. And, uh, well, uh, you we invited you in, and you came along, and the four of us had a good afternoon, I think. Yeah, I was really pleased, and I was happy I was home at that time when you called, so, uh, and got everything set up, and uh, we were able to talk to Jerry and Barb. So, let's, uh, let's call that up and uh, go back to that interview. Okay. Well, we've got two good guests today, Jeff. I'm going to start with Jerry, uh, Jerry Hayes. And uh, just for a quick background, Jerry was the state inspector in Florida. And and he's had quite an adventure since he was there. And I'm just going to turn it over to him and let him tell all about everything. Well, you know, thanks, Kim. And I appreciate uh, your time and being here and talk to uh, your audience. Um, but like everything else in life, everything kind of ties together when you behind yourself uh let's go back into time 2006 i was the chief of the apiary section for the florida department of agriculture and this thing called colony collapse disorder ccd was found on my watch and uh we were trying to figure out what was causing uh, these these uh, colony disappearances colony deaths uh we didn't know what it was so we called it as a disorder uh, trying to figure out if it was a disease or if it was a parasite or what have you. So in parallel with that, in my office in Gainesville, Florida, there was a USDA CMAVE office, the Center for Medical and Veterinary Entomology, and they invited me to a workshop where they were going to control malaria-carrying mosquitoes using this super-duper new technology, remember this is 2006, uh, called RNAi. So I went to the workshop. And I thought, <clears throat> this is very cool. It's uh, uh, a normal, natural process. It's going on in you and I. And could we adapt or use this to do something to improve honeybee health? So I stopped at a, a very close colleague of mine's office at the University of Florida there in Gainesville, uh, Dr. Jamie Ellis. And I said, Jamie, this is what I think I heard. Um, what do you think we should do? Should we try to pursue this and learn more about this? This is 2000. And and six. And we decided to do that. I got some money from the state legislature and uh, Jamie and I started uh, asking questions, uh, trying to learn, simply learn about uh, RNAi. And uh, there was a company in Israel called Biologic that was already uh, experimenting and using RNAi to uh, uh, try to control a, a virus that was very early on correlated with CCD called the Israeli acute paralysis virus. They heard we were asking questions about RNAi, contacted us, and Jamie and I and Biologics decided to formally collaborate together simply to learn. Uh, this is uh, the guys who got the Nobel Prize for this didn't get it until 2009, I think it was. So uh, we started uh, learning about RNAi with Theologic's help. We did some small field trials, uh, seeing about how to deliver this stuff. And then fast forward to 2011, when Monsanto acquired Theologic's, not because of the honeybee thing, because <clears throat> Monsanto never had a relationship with beekeepers or beekeepers with Monsanto, except perhaps at the cereal. Uh, but they wanted to um, use it uh, to uh, replace chemical treatments for, uh, you know, crop pests, uh, corn earworm and rootworm and canola flea beetles and all that kind of stuff. Um, they wanted to keep uh, the honeybee piece, and uh, they looked around their 22,000 employees and found out nobody knew anything about honeybees. So they asked me if I wanted to come and, and uh, participate in in this uh, journey to learn more about RNAi and how it could help honeybees. And, and truthfully, it took me uh, a couple months uh, to make a, a decision because, you know, everybody hates Monsanto. That's kind of genetic too, I think. 
Um, and so uh, asking friends and family and everything else about that. And some people said, have you lost your mind? And other people said, do it. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm late career and only thing they can do is, is fire me. It's a great new technology. Let's see if we can develop something that will help the, the honeybee industry uh, that uh, uh, would be better and safer and more valuable. So uh, 2012, I made the jump to Monsanto. Uh, we started uh, doing uh, research on RNAi, uh, uh, you know, what genes to target, uh, how to deliver it. Um, we had some of the largest field trials in the history of beekeeping, I think, uh, uh, throughout the United States, and uh, found that, um, like everybody else who's tried to use RNAi, Sometimes it works really well, and sometimes it doesn't work really well. And, and you have that inconsistency there uh, that sometimes it's location-dependent. And, and so there's, I think there's a whole lot more science to be done before uh, a product is going to be available using RNAi to help the beekeeping industry, whether it's uh, virus control or grow mite control or, or what have you. So I had given myself uh, five years to see where this was going to go. I uh, actually spent six years there and <clears throat> encouraged Monsanto to uh, uh, continue the, the science and spending money. Uh, but um, I didn't want to hang around uh, any longer. I wanted to see if I could try to bring some, some value uh, to the beekeeping industry, the, bee, you know, the industry I love. I've been in this industry forever, and, and you, know, you have to have a passion for something uh, in order to, uh, you know, to be halfway good at it. So uh, I've decided a couple of weeks ago, left uh, Monsanto uh, and uh, going to uh, go to work for a company called Vita, V-I-T-A-B Health. Uh, their home office is in uh, uh, England. Uh, they have uh, uh, products uh, for beekeeping, uh, rural control and, and supplemental food and EFB and AFB uh, ID and all these kind of things, but they've never had a, a large presence in the in the U.S., hey, uh, Jerry, they have a product called Applegar. Yes. Was that was that V I T A B Health? Yes, sir. Okay, good. B Health broke up a little bit. All right, good. Yeah, no, and and so uh, um, they have a product called Applegard, which I think many beekeepers are aware of. It's a thymol gel product to control varroa. Controls varroa very well and has low uh, honeybee toxicity. And they have some other products, and I. I I think we want to work on some uh, more products like that that are are maybe not uh, you know organic but near natural uh, to uh, bring to the beekeeping industry so that the beekeepers have more choices on on how they can manage their colonies and uh, bring some uh, sustainable health back to them. So uh, this is all new to me as as well, and uh, looking forward to it. Uh, this is kind of exciting for me. It's quite a story, Jerry. Um, uh, of course, the question, the first question that comes to mind is is uh, the work going going on ongoing at Monsanto with RNAi. Do they do you know if they what what the future might be because of the big change in ownership? Yeah, no, and that's that's great, and that's one of those uh, toss ups in the air as well. As you know, many of you listeners might know, uh, Bayer. Uh, has purchased Monsanto. Uh, the, the deal is incomplete, but uh, uh, Bayer is now the number one stockholder of Monsanto, and they uh, uh, are going to take over administrative uh, control. Now, Bayer has been very active, of course, in Honeybee Health and have fee to bee program and, and uh, you know, uh, a bunch of other programs, uh, not only here, but uh, in Europe, uh, in order to uh, connect growers and beekeepers together to protect uh, honeybees more. So I think Bayer will probably continue with the RNAi project uh, in some way. Um, and certainly they have uh, uh, the, the funds and the resources and the smart people to, to move it forward. Uh, because I think the, the goal is that uh, this product is, is uh, RNAi is still very exciting. Uh, it's uh, that normal natural process I mentioned before. Um, but it needs to uh, be fine-tuned in order to make it work more efficiently uh, for beekeepers. I was, I was wondering on the RNAi discussion and, and some of the 
uh, news releases that came out earlier this year with uh, Sam Ramsey's discussion or uh, discussion about the problem with the varroa being not with the hemolymph, but also, but really they're they're feeding off the the fat. And I was wondering, does the RNAi is it was designed to be delivered through the blood or the hemolymph? Is it is that maybe one of the reasons why it wasn't as effective as originally thought? Yeah, and 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 so let me just say, back up a little bit here, sure. probably because you know you assume you know what happens, um, <laughs> and so everybody knows what DNA is, um, and uh, DNA is the complete uh, recipe for you. The complete code for you uh, is in DNA, and the complete code for you and me and your cat and your dog and everything is in the nucleus of every cell of your body every cell of your body has to complete code for you well the cool thing is an interesting thing and and the reason somebody got the nobel prize is that dna even though it has all the messages that you need to uh, live to metabolize it's going on in your body right now never leaves the nucleus of the cell of your body so how the heck does uh, uh, that instruction to tell your cell to, you know, make a protein or not make a protein or dial up or dial it down? How does that actually happen? And so what happens is that the DNA makes a copy of that specific, that one specific instruction and a cousin of DNA, RNA, takes it to that cell site to tell your cell to do something or not do something. Um, and the not do something is RNAi. The I stands for interference because you can't have things running in your cells all the time. You have to turn them up or dial them down. And so your body is communicating. Your cells are communicating within each, o- each other all the time. And so what uh, has happened is we have, uh, you know, the varroa genome has been sequenced and the honeybee genome has been sequenced. So you can pick out those genes in varroa that uh, might be sensitive uh, to RNAi, um, make uh, an RNAi, copy it basically what the honeybee can't do, and then feed it back to to honeybees. And what the thought is, is that it's going to be uh, uh, delivered to uh, uh, honeybee larva uh, and then uh, uh, be taken up by these foundress of roa mite, the female mite that enters the cell, and uh, it will kill her or damage her, depending on what the target is, and uh, uh, you know, slow down um, their their population growth. It doesn't kill them. Uh, there again, this normal natural process isn't like a chemical. It doesn't drop them dead right now. It takes a, a few days, sometimes a few weeks, in order to impact them. But mm-hmm. so that that was the goal, and I think that's a a great goal if if they can make it work. Wow. Jeff, I'm gonna I'm gonna break in here for sure. a moment, Jeff, um, and 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 go back to what Jerry said earlier about things all being kind of tied together, and 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 this is why uh, uh, Barb is with us today, and Jerry's with us today. Uh, today we were supposed to have pollinator day, and we got rained out. We were there for about an hour, and everybody went home soggy. But Jerry was here representing the. Uh, Honeybee Health Coalition, which he's on the board of. Barb was here because she is the state entomologist and the state bee inspector for the state of Ohio, and she was representing that part of our government. And we were we were looking at our pollinator gardens, one of which is a bear feed bee garden. And with that was uh, Leo Sharakawa, who was the... Uh, uh, the uh, he won the award. That he was a student award winner this year for Bayer's program, and he's studying uh, he's studying a way to control American fowl brood with another pest rather than with a chemical. So all of us were at the same place at the same time today, uh, kind of all tied together, all brought together by flowers and bees and each other. So I uh, just wanted to bring bring that up. That's why we were all here. So, Barb, I want to re- welcome you here, uh, and and glad you could make it. And we're going to get back to what's going on in Ohio in a second. I know, Jeff, you've got another question for for Jerry on RNA, and I want to hear I want to hear a little bit more about that. Well, that that was really the the question was how that 
if if that would make a difference if the if the, the varroa were in fact feeding on the fat supply as opposed to the hemolymph. But it sounds actually the research was focused on the delivery through the larva and not the adult bee. So I'm, my question was off. It sounds like yeah, yeah, and, and the and the problem with all that, Jeff, is that you know I'm going to use the wrong terminology here, but you think of RNA, RNAi. You know, DNA would have you basically your proteins, amino acids that are in a, a certain configuration. And um, when you eat a protein or your dog eats a protein, um, it's digested. And so being able to feed it to bees, get it past their digestive system because they'll digest it just like food, mm-hmm. get it into their hemolymph or into their uh, fat bodies, and then have the roll of feed on them and take that up is really, really hard to get it in and get enough dosage. So it's being looked at in a <coughs> excuse me in a different way uh, to get it into the founders' mites uh, more effectively. They so didn't they find the bees were more healthy even though they didn't get great mite control yet. Um, not that I've seen data on that. Um, the bees uh, the material seems to be location dependent, and where the location was good nutritionally because of flowers, uh, the bees were healthier. Um, and so, um, Barb, the, uh, um, the bees were healthier because of those resources available at that location, not because of the RNA. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm not incorrect, I believe that some people have harnessed this technology working on uh, greening and citrus. They're trying to make it work on greening and citrus. There has, everybody's gotten very excited over the last several years about RNAi because there again, it's this normal natural process of how cells communicate to themselves. And it's, they've tried to make it work on citrus screening and uh, Colorado potato beetles and, and other things. And, and, and the problem is, is because it's normal natural um, and things can eat it, uh, you spill it on the ground and bacteria and fungus will eat it. It's a food. Uh, you try to put it in sugar syrup for bees and organisms in the sugar syrup will eat it for food. So how you how you protect it, encapsulate it or something so it doesn't break down as quickly has been really, really hard. Um, and, and so that, that is one of the hurdles that hasn't been uh, cleared as yet. Mm-hmm. Well, Barb, let me let me uh, let me uh, bring you in here for just a little bit. Uh, Jerry started back in 2006 uh, talking about what was called colony collapse disorder. Uh, how is how is Ohio faring with with the issues going on with bee health in the last few years? Yeah, so I, I started my position in uh, 2009. Um, at the time, we had about 26,000 beekeepers and 600 something apiaries. We now have 33,000 apiaries and um, about 800 or 8,000, 8,600 um, beekeepers. So, what's happening is because of the colony collapse disorder, we have more and more people wanting to be beekeepers every year. Um, and there's a huge learning curve with beekeeping. Um, so, so my job with the Ohio Department of Agriculture is to is regulation. I'm supposed to uh, make sure that they register their BR, their apiary, uh, make sure they don't have disease, and they're you know taking you know taking proper care of their hives, so to speak. Um, what what I really do is is teach. I do a lot of extension because it's just it's very difficult. Uh, for all these beekeepers to know how to keep their bees. So instead of trying to regulate, it's it's more in the process of regulating. I'm, I'm actually doing extension. So I travel around Ohio. I inspect beehives. Um, I give talks. Um, I'm, right now I've been uh, out inspecting beehives because uh, Ohio has a growing uh, queen industry where they're raising queen bees and uh, selling them. So we wanted to encourage beekeepers in Ohio to buy Ohio bees, just so we're not you know, bringing in more unknown pests and diseases into Ohio. So we try to uh, encourage beekeepers to sell, sell their own queens and sell their own nukes. So because of that, we want to make sure beekeepers are buying healthy bees. So we inspect them and give them a, 
a certificate of health, just like you would be buying a champion horse or a champion cow or something like that. So that's what I've been busy uh, doing uh, so far this entire season. Then I have other programs. I'm involved with uh, the, the National Honeybee Survey. Um, I work with their uh, Honeybee Health Coalition also, working with some teachers to help students. So I do all kinds of little, little things on the side. How's the, uh, in Ohio, the, the apiary inspection, do they still have all the county inspectors? They still yeah, it's a great question. So Ohio is different from most states um, because each county will appoint and pay for their own county inspector. Mm -hmm. So we have 88 counties in Ohio, all but uh, 10 of them have a county inspector. So the county inspector gets a list from the Ohio Department of Ag of all the apiary locations and the beekeepers, and their job is to go out and inspect the bees and make sure that they're healthy. Then they give the beekeeper recommendations. What's the prevalence of uh, ABF, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, American fowl brood, AFB, in, in Ohio now? Uh, we're less than 1%. Um, there are certain pockets where we haven't been able to get uh, really get it exterminated, uh, but it's less than, it's like 0.01%. Good. And Barb, this is, this is Jerry here. Um, with the huge growth in, in the interest in bees and, and beekeeping and, and what have you, I know you have probably just thousands of, of hobby beekeepers. What's your message to them? Because I know you're doing a lot of, you know, what we would call extension. You're doing educational outreach and what have you. You're not so much the bee police as you are, you know, extension, trying to bring the appropriate knowledge to them. So what, what is your message to these new beekeepers mostly? Uh, what I wish they could all do is to go to their extension, their university websites, and read books about beekeeping and not believe the stuff that they see on, uh, on YouTube because there's a lot, of, a lot of misinformation on the Internet. There's a lot of misinformation on some of the email links that go around. Um, you know, Kim has a great program that people should listen to, but... Yeah, go to the university websites, read their information, and uh, read those thousands and thousands of books written on beekeeping. So go go with well, that uh, and, and less on the YouTubes. How about, uh, um, can you tell them a little bit about the Honey Bee Health Coalition and, and what uh, you know they offer? Yeah, a great question. So the Honey Bee Health Coalition is a, Oh, it's a kind of collaboration with businesses, um, growers, uh, beekeepers, um, some of the uh, nonprofit organizations, Ohio Department of Agriculture is a member. And they try to provide uh, educational material for beekeepers. The best thing that they have done so far, which is a, a wonderful tool, it's called the Tools for Varroa Mite. It's a, a bulletin, about 24 pages long. Uh, you can go online and... Uh, look at it you can print it they also have videos but they the the bulletin is excellent because they tell you you know what products are available if you don't want to use chemicals they have other options in there but they tell you um, what the levels of mites you should have in your colony as the season progresses they tell you what products are best you know it's, it's in like in the spring and then the summer and the fall what products work best and in the back they tell you how to use these different products or methods. Um, again, if you don't, you want to use chemicals, they have other options in there, but they have it all very well spelled out. And then on their website, they have videos on exactly how to do these different techniques. All of this information is free to anybody that, that wants to dial it up, right? Absolutely. It's all free. They just go to honeybeehealthcoalition.org. Right. And, uh, and another group that I, I think I want you to do an advertising blip on is is BIP, <laughs> being informed yeah. partnership and their surveys and and what data and information they bring to the industry to you know that to, to help everybody understand what's going on. Yeah, the the, the be informed uh, partnership. I've been um, pr kind of promoting that for years too, uh, because it's a survey. It's taken by beekeepers, and I urge. Uh, Ohio beekeepers to take that survey 
Uh, it takes a little bit of time to do it, but the information on that is uh, amazing. It's fantastic. So you can go on there. You want to decide whether or not you want to control your mite population. They'll, they'll go either by region or even by your state. You know, what people, what percent of people treated and what their winter, what loss was versus those who, who did treat. They test different products or they guess they rate different products, like using the different mite control products, which things, which things had, you know, a, um, better success as far as reduced bee loss. So they asked beekeepers all these management options and what they did, and then they compare that to what your uh, winter winter bee loss is. So it's just excellent information on there. And they're kind of in partnership with the National Honey Bee Survey. Uh, so you can go on there and you can see what viruses are in the different states that have participated, what are, when our when our mite population rises and falls, where the you know, SEMA starts to show up. So all that information is available to any beekeeper who wants to really understand what's going on. So there's a lot of good, reliable information as opposed to... Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you're trying to decide, research. should I do a natural mite control? Should I just use screen bottom boards? Um, you can go on there and see, well, those who use just screen bottom boards as a technique to monitor their mite population, they still lost 60% of their colonies. Yeah. The ones who used uh, alcohol wash, you know, lost 20% of their colonies. So you can they get actual figures. It's all based on uh, beekeeper surveys, you know, replies, but it's still really the best thing out there to be able to measure what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Last, one of the last podcasts we did, we talked with, uh, James Wilkes of, of Hive Tracks, and he is working with the Bee Informed Partnership and in trying to provide automatic information through their collection uh, going directly to the BIP in, uh, if, if the beekeeper wants that to happen. So that's, it's, it's becoming a little bit easier to participate in these surveys and this data collection. Yeah, and you can also see what beekeepers are, are around where your apiaries are, too, which is important. And it's interesting to see, like, when the other beekeepers, if they put that data into hive tracks, when they start, you know, taking their honey off and they start treating, that kind of gives a cue to those who are less experienced to know when they should take their honey off and, and treat. Yeah. 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 And let me let me jump in here. You know, before Barilla mites, um, you know, honeybees could, uh, you know, live by themselves in the environment. They were feral insects, if you will. They were wild. Now with Varroa, um, they've become managed livestock or a pet like your dog or your cat. So beekeepers have to be engaged in, in management uh, or um, their colonies are going to die uh, simply because of the lack of information and, and lack of knowledge. And I, I guess, you know, the message that, that probably all of us uh, want to is that there are management uh, techniques, there's management information uh, that tie together so that we can keep honeybees alive and not have them die because of, of lack of knowledge or, or lack of that management uh, uh, expertise. Yeah, and I think the key is to, if you monitor your mite population or just monitor your bees, all summer, you can catch problems before they get out of hand. So you can still, you know, do whatever you need to to correct the problem and to save your bees instead of waiting till fall when it's too late. Pretty much, uh, Barb, all beekeeping is local. Uh, I don't keep bees in Ohio like uh, uh, Jerry does in, in uh, Missouri, and neither of us keep bees like, like uh, people do in Florida. So what are you finding in Ohio that that successful beekeepers are using and doing that that uh, you might recommend to not only Ohio certainly but surrounding states but uh, places like us? What what's 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 working right now? The the tricky part is to find a location that has a lot of season long forage. The bees that I found are the healthiest that are able to, you know, deal with the mites and the virus, have season-long flowers. You know, they're, they're away from the cities. They're away from, you know, continuous monocultures where there's wildflowers and trees. 
where they can where they can find food all season. So if you can find a location like that, which is difficult, uh, I think it takes one to five acres of forage per colony of bees now to support them. To find locations like that away from other beehives or other apiaries, uh, that's that's really important. And the people who are doing that, who find those places, are doing well. And also, if they can, you know, support their own bees and make splits from their own bees instead of bringing bees in from other states. Um, the packages, if you're going to get a package, you almost need to read Queen with Ohio Queen. Hmm. And not, not to get everybody angry <laughs> about packages. <laughs> but the, the, the ones who can split their own bees, their bees survive the winter, they split their own bees and make their own queens. They're growing instead of losing bees every year and starting over again. Yeah. I think that's true from what I've heard. That's pretty much true for every location. I mean, the, the beekeepers here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, there's a very, very large group of sustainable beekeepers who are very much into their uh, into raising their own queens from the area. So uh, I think that's, a, that's good words for everything, uh, for, for every region. Sorry. I mean, I understand getting a few packages or queens to try them out, but in general, to be sustainable, you know, keep your own bees healthy yeah. and just work with those bees. It's a great message. I think, I think the, the, the only issue I have with that, Barb, is both of those places are taken in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very hard to find places. It's very difficult. So there are maps online. You can look at where the parks are and the wild areas and try to stake your claim. But it is difficult to find places where you're isolated from other apiaries. Jeff, I know we're, we're, getting, we're running out of time here, and, and all, all of us have to be someplace else in, in just a little bit. So sure. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, I, I want to get back to um, – to have folks stay tuned because I want to get back to Jerry as he gets uh, involved with Vita B Health because I want to know more about what the, what's going on there. And and Barb, I want to thank you for being here today. Certainly, uh, uh, we we drug you out of a wet wet uh, pollinator field, so so maybe it wasn't so bad. But uh, I had a thank good you time. We had some good pollinator day. And for, anything else, Jeff? Well, I just was going to ask Jerry real quick. Uh, how does it feel no, to no longer be in the crosshairs of uh, the radical beekeeper group? I, I bet you feel a little bit relieved at this point. Well, you know, <clears throat> relieved and, and sad at the same time. You know, I, I started for, for Monsanto and, and came in a little bit naive, I think. And so, you know, I, I've been in the industry a long time and, and, and that bought me some some time, but I, I do have, you know, scar tissue to show you if we're ever uh, alone uh, together. Well, uh, of, well there of, is a video some going. Of, some you... of the early days. <laughs> well, I'm sure it would, I'm sure it would have been stressful. I, I, I just can't imagine it wouldn't be stressful. Uh, well, yeah, no, but you never know. Yeah. You never, you never know till you try. Mm -hmm. um, this was a big corporation. Um, they had technology. They had the money the yeah. smart people, the expensive equipment. And, and, you know, for instance, we've been talking about Varroa for 30 years and there's been, you know, lots of money thrown at Varroa, but it's always been in those $30,000, $50,000 blocks. And, and one thing I learned is a product can't be researched, um, re registered and developed um, for that kind of money. So there's a lot of information out there, but nobody ever had enough money uh, to go in the right direction, to go from point A to point B to an actual product. And and I was hoping that, you know, Monsanto would be able to do that. And, and hopefully with their new owner, Bayer, they'll continue to do this and work on the science. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I like to think I gave it a, a good shot and had good support from the industry uh, and others um, and, uh, you know, did what I could. And, and now it's time to, to try something different. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you did. Uh, as painful to, to read and watch you take those hits, but um, it, you, I think you did good work and you uh, blazed a good trail. So thank you. Well, that's that's it for me, Kim. Uh, I, we can you guys can get back out in the rain if you want. 
Jeff, I'm gonna uh, we're gonna sum this up here in just a minute with a few announcements and things coming up. So uh, if that's it, uh, Barb and Jerry, thank you, and uh, uh, glad you could make it today. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Barb. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, that was a pretty fun Saturday, Kim. I'm glad you guys gave me a call. Yeah, like I said, it worked out okay. Rain or rain. Didn't shine, the sun didn't shine and it rained like mad, but uh, it turned out okay, just uh, by accident almost. <laughs> That's good. Well, so what else is coming up for us, uh, Kim? Well, Jeff, we've got, uh, I got a bunch of stuff here I want to talk about just real quick. On the next Kim and Jim uh, webinar show in September, we're going to be back in Jim 2's B yard. Oh, no. We're going to take a look at those. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to take a look at those packages we put in last spring, and we looked at them again in July. But yeah. if you caught that show, you know that we had a swarm that day. Yes. The day we were there, they decided to swarm, <laughs> and we caught it after the show. So we're going to take a look at that swarm, too. Always after the video stops recording, right? It is, yeah. yeah. And Kathy and I and Jean, uh, our advertising person, are going to be at EAS, um, it's going to be next week, the uh, the second week in August, and we plan on doing a few Facebook Live interviews with the vendors there. If you can't make it to EAS, you can't make it. You're not going to be there, are you, Jeff? No, I'm not going to be able to make it this year. Yeah. Well, if you can't make it to EAS, tune into these uh, Facebook Live things because we get to talk to vendors, and they kind of get a chance to show off what's new and what's going on. I watched that and, last uh, year. If, yeah, I watched that last year, and that was really fun. Or was that ABA, uh, 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 the well, we've done them at both, so yeah. you may have seen both. Okay. We do at the big meetings. And you and I are going to try and hook up with some of the speakers at EAS and do a podcast or two while we're there, too. I know the timing's tough, but uh, if we can make it work, we're going to catch some of the some of the speakers that are there. Absolutely. That'd be um, great. <clears throat> speaking of podcasts, here's who we've got coming up in the next few weeks, Jeff. i got Dan Conlon, the president of the Russian Beep Readers Group. Uh, I don't know what... This time, uh, currently, Russians and, and, and <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure where we'll go with that one, but he's the president of the bee, Russian Bee Breeders Group. I've got Marina Marchesi, you know, my co-author mm -hmm. uh, with the Honey Connoisseur, and she's the president of the American Honey Tasting Society. Yes. I think everybody knows Dewey Karen. Yes. Uh, we've got him coming up. We've got Tammy Horn Potter, who's a Kentucky State Apiary Inspector and a whole lot of other things. And... Uh, we had Tom Theobald recently, and Tom Theobald and Jeff Anderson. I, I think we're going to get them back on, and they're going to continue the dis discussion on Neonex. That would be good. Uh, that we started with Tom. And Eric Wenger from Two Source Honey is going to be out with us coming hey, up pretty did, soon. Didn't you do a uh, NPR interview on A1 with uh, Eric? Uh, 1A, yeah. 1A, he yeah. And I, he and I were on uh, 1A here about a month or so ago and talking about the problem with the uh, adulterated honey coming in from, from overseas. We're also going to have Ed Colby, our bottom board columnist, and he's also the president of the Colorado Beekeepers Association. I think it's a great lineup we got coming up, Jeff. Okay, sounds great. Well, <clears throat> we got lucky today, I think, being able to catch both of these good folks. We lost the pollinator day to Mother Nature, but we gained insight into parts of our industry we probably wouldn't have ever gotten firsthand because of the rain. Jerry's history of his work with Monsanto was especially interesting, I thought, since now both he and essentially Monsanto were gone. I was able to visit him a few times in St. Louis when he was there and got to meet some of those bright people he mentioned and even gave a lunch, lunch and learn talk to a room full of very, very bright and interested people. Now that that work has moved to Bayer, I hope they keep working with the RNAI project. Jerry was right in that they do have their fingers in the beekeeping industry, and they keep moving the ball down the field in, in their work with forage, student awards, and funding other good research projects. Bee culture, as you probably know, has done several Kim and Jim programs with the folks they've funded, and the advances they are making are really, have really been exciting. But Jerry did a good job of spelling out the difficulties with this subject, too, I think. It's trickier than I thought, and not an easy task, it seems, to make it fulfill its early promise. We'll have to get Jerry back on after he's been with Vita Bee Health for a bit and let him share what he's doing there, too, I think. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see what his follow-through is going to be like. 
And what a delight with Barb. Wasn't mm-hmm. she fun to talk to? I've known her since she started here in Ohio and have always enjoyed working with her in the several projects we've been on over the years. When I was the president of Ohio State Beekeepers, we worked on programs together. And even some when I was the program director for the local Medina Beekeepers. Both she and I went through the crash and burn time when CCD first hit. And it was good hearing the numbers of both bees and beekeepers in Ohio were rebounding. And of course, our extension work, now that Jim Two is retired from that position, is indispensable for our beekeepers. Couple that with her work with the Honey Bee Health Coalition, is, and beekeepers are getting solid information uh, every, every time they turn around, if they go to the right resource. And it seems it must be working because the stats on American fall brood here in Ohio are excellent. Less than 1%. I don't, I'm not sure it's ever been that low. But what I like most, I think, was her advice on keeping bees alive. That's, that's the what's working in Ohio question we had, Jeff, if you remember. Her remarks, season-long forage, isolated from cities and other beekeepers, stay away from agriculture, use local greens when possible, and probably best of all, use YouTube for entertainment, not education. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. There's lots of good information out there today, Jeff. I'm glad we were able to get you on such short notice after we were rained out. And thanks to Jerry and Barb. And that's beekeeping today. It sure is. Oh, that was good. Hey, before we go, I want to remind our listeners to subscribe to Beekeeping Today podcast wherever you listen and to leave us a rating. Make it a five-star rating. Your rating will help other beekeepers find us quickly. And as always, we welcome your comments and feedback at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. So that's it for me, Kim. I appreciate your time today. And, and uh, I think that's all I've got here too, Jeff. All right. Well, you take care and have a good trip to EAS. I look forward to uh, at least getting one podcast in there with you. We'll see what we can do. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.